positive self-talk and not letting society define my worth has become a true staple of my own personal success. There's something in that healing process that, oh man, you can't even put words on what it does for your psyche, not to mention that you can use your testimony to help others. Listen, yeah, I'm flawed, but I love it. I accept it. I own it. And if you don't like it, that's okay. Being a trailblazer for your own life and what you stand for will inspire more people than you could ever imagine. Welcome to the Art of Speaking Up a podcast that helps professional women access the limitless potential that lies within them. I'm your host, Jessica Guzik, and my mission is to help you find that spark inside you that has the power to transform your career in ways you may not have thought possible. I'm so excited that you're here. And now, on to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Jess. I'm the host of this podcast. I'm a working woman in the nine to five world and on nights and weekends. I'm the creator of this show and I have been really excited to share this conversation with you for so many reasons. One of the reasons that I've really been looking forward to you hearing this is because when it comes to women achieving great things, and advancing in their careers. I believe that we all have this potential within us to get past whatever is difficult and whatever we're struggling with and to get into this optimal state. And sometimes when you're struggling or things are difficult, you might think that you can't do something and you might have this perceived limitation to what you are able to accomplish. But I believe that there is something inside of us, this limitless well of peace and inner strength and inspiration, that when we tap into that and when you tap into that, the limits that you may perceive exist for you can actually be eliminated and you may find that you're able to do things and achieve things that surpass what you might have thought. And It was such a joy to interview today's guest, Ashley, because so much of her career and so much of what she shares in this episode is all about how she taps into her inner reserve of peace and strength to achieve really difficult and really courageous things. As you're going to hear, Ashley has spent a good chunk of her career in the Coast Guard, which she talks more about and explains more about what that looked like. And she is also the author of the book, The Hurricane Within, which is an incredible story about her life, about her time in the Coast Guard, and about her involvement doing Coast Guard rescues in the thick of Hurricane Harvey. And in this conversation, we cover a lot of stuff. We really go like up and down the spectrum of topics I love. But so much of what we talk about comes back to how Ashley has learned to cultivate and tap into strength. And I know that so many of the women who listen to this show are trying to do that and trying to figure out how you get to your next level, or how you access strength and courage during these moments that are really challenging for you. And before I interviewed Ashley, I had the joy of reading her book, which is incredible, by the way, and you'll hear us talk about it. But as I was reading about what she does in the Coast Guard, I just kept thinking in my mind over and over and over, like, how does she do these things that to me feel so big and so terrifying? And I was so excited to get her wisdom because even though many of you listening may not be in the Coast Guard, your job may look very different from Ashley's job. I think a shared experience that many of us have had is being in a moment, a moment where we're feeling challenged, a moment where we're feeling stretched, a moment where we're feeling afraid, and really being presented with the choice in that moment of how we want to show up. And I believe that we have so much power if we are patient, if we are self-loving, if we are committed, 
we have so much power to make new choices about how to show up in these difficult situations. And I loved hearing what Ashley has learned through her process of doing that throughout her career in the Coast Guard and throughout some of her life experiences. I am so excited for you to meet her. And with that, I'm going to cut into our conversation and I hope you enjoy it. My name is Ashley Leppert. I am a recent veteran of the United States Coast Guard. I was an avionics electrical technician for about 14 years, and I am also a new author, and I wrote my uh, memoir called The Hurricane Within. I'm so, so, so excited to dig into your experiences. And can you take us back to when you first had a thought of, oh, I should join the Coast Guard or I want to join the Coast Guard? Sure. Absolutely, Jessica. So I honestly don't have the greatest answer for this because I feel like there was a culmination of a few things that happened throughout my life that kind of led me to this path. But one of the main things is I always loved the water. I was on the swim team for quite a long time. And I also knew that I wanted to serve and join the military. I just didn't know quite what capacity. And then shortly after my high school graduation, one of my best friends, Nash, unfortunately was killed in a boating accident. So that kind of just made me, it kind of sparked something inside me even more to want to help people and be on the water doing, you know, rescues and stuff like that. So, and I think many people may not necessarily be familiar with the Coast Guard. So just to level set, would you be able to give a really high level overview of what the Coast Guard does and what it means to be in the Coast Guard, you know, in the position that you were in? Absolutely. So the Coast Guard is kind of one of those forgotten branches of the military, I think. It's because we do so much work kind of behind the scenes in our home front as opposed to being over fighting wars and things like that. But it's a it's a multi-agency or excuse me, multi-mission agency that revolves around search and rescue, law enforcement, maritime safety, uh, waterways, security and patrols. So there's just we're kind of like the jack of all trades, truthfully. But for me specifically, I was in aviation. Um, so we did a lot of search and rescue and kind of just did a lot of training to keep our boater safety and um, just to keep people safe on the water and be there at the call if need be, if they were in trouble. Fantastic. And hopefully people listening will get a chance to read your book. Your stories are incredible. And one of the things that was so interesting for me to learn is just all of the conditions that you have to endure and what it's like to be on a search and rescue mission. And for someone who's less familiar with that, I would love for you to share, you know, what what a search and rescue mission could mean, what types of conditions you have to endure so that people can really begin to understand how heroic you truly are. And, and we'll unpeel that as we go through the interview. But I wanted to start there. So the best way I kind of uh, describe people what my job was as an aviation search and rescue individual, um, pretty much we are on call as if, you know, we're firefighters or people at the hospital. We're kind of just standing by for a circumstance to arise where someone needs our help. So we typically stand 24-hour shifts, and then we have a ready crew standing by. So that consists of a pilot, a co-pilot, the flight mechanic, which is what I was, and then a rescue swimmer. So typically we just are there on call. We'll get the phone call, which would sound the alarms throughout the whole hangar. So once we hear that alarm, Ed is like an instant, okay, here we go. So we run out, we get our flight suit and our flight gear, and we get all ready to go. We inspect the aircraft and we're in the helicopter airborne in typically less than, I would say, 10, 15 minutes because We know that somebody's out there needing us. So we get the engine started, we take off, and there's a lot of radio calls giving us direction and where we're headed to. And then it is a very big talking point where we say, okay, this is what we're going to encounter. How are we going to rescue these people? What is the safest course of action? We're looking at winds. We're looking at our fuel state. There is a lot of different check marks and safety precautions that we that we take. And then at that point, it's like, okay, we're we're using our visuals and our different equipments to be able to actually search for the people. And then we go through and I lower the hoist down and lower the rescue swimmer. And it's a whole lot of hovering and talking on the radios and conning people in position. And so it's it's quite a chaotic evolution. So, but again, the ultimate goal is to bring these people home that are in our that are in trouble. And if we can do that, then it's a job well done. 
when you talked about that, it reminded me about, you know, when you talked in your story about how you kind of have this switch in your mind that you turn on and off. And as soon as you get called and as soon as, you know, you know that there's someone that needs rescuing or there's something like this happening, you kind of just get into a zone. Can you say more about that? Because I think that's really interesting and relevant to a lot of people who are, you know, maybe not in the Coast Guard, but in a high performing type of profession. Yes. I think for me, the one word to kind of encompass that training is just adaptability. You know, from the very beginning in boot camp, us military members are taught, um, you know, to adapt and overcome. And in aviation specifically, we do a risk versus gain model. And we do, you know, assess and say, hey, is this risk that we're taking, whether it be flying in bad weather or, you know, going out very offshore for long distance, you know, we say, hey, is this risk worth the, the gain of possibly saving somebody's life, which the answer is always yes. You know, if we were trained to take those risks to be able to save a life. So in my personal adaptability and having the ability to compartmentalize in the face of danger is, is just a combination of my military training and, and my foundation of my personal faith as a Christian too, to help me have that peace knowing that I'm grounded in the understanding of my purpose. And there's an undeniable peace and calm that comes along with having that. That's so interesting. You went straight into something that I was planning on asking you about later that also really fascinated me about you and your story and your book, which is just that, you know, that piece that you are able to tap into and the way that you're sort of able to guide yourself to where you need to be in a certain moment is so fascinating because the situations you're in are so high pressure and scary. And the contrast between those two things and like your ability to cultivate that inside was so fascinating to me. Do you feel like that's something that people can learn to do? Like, do you feel like this is a universal skill of tapping into something greater, deeper, more peaceful when, you know, when things around feel, feel so intense or scary? Absolutely. You know, I just, I feel like for me, there, there's just this, this ability to face the fear of whatever the unknown is for that search and rescue case. And, you know, for me personally, like I said, that peace that I have found through my faith and, and trusting that God has a bigger plan for what I'm doing, that truthfully just fuels my personal peace. Now, of course, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm not terrified at times or I'm not scared or, you know, man, today might be the day that I don't come home. You know, of course, all those thoughts as, you know, a human are natural. But again, I just, I'm very much grounded in the fact that I know that we are all on this earth for a purpose. And, you know, my purpose is to bring glory to God and what I do. And what better way to do that than saving people? I mean, it's just, it's such a, it's to me, it's an, an honor and a blessing. Yes. Oh my gosh. It, it's so incredible to hear your perspectives on that. And I often ask guests about early careers and sort of that initial entrance into their career path, which I think sometimes can be difficult. Were you always able to sort of cultivate that balance and kind of give yourself that inner sense of safety and faith? Or did you have moments in the beginning where you felt like a little bit shaken or a little bit rocky entering into this, you know, this new line of work that you do or that you were doing? Oh, for sure. I think just like with anything, the more you train to do something, it becomes just robotic-like and just a natural reaction. So in Coast Guard, specifically aviation, we do a ton of training to prepare for these types of circumstances. And we go out there and we do hoist training with boats and we have annual tests and all these requirements. So it almost is like when you go out there, it's just something switches and you're just a robot doing exactly what you had trained to do. And then that coupled with the piece that I had from just knowing that I'm out there doing such a wonderful thing to save people, it really is just a comforting kind of piece that it's it's really hard to put into words almost. I love that. And I I wanted to ask sort of about your sense of grit and the physical and mental challenges that are part of being in the Coast Guard. Were you always that way? So were you someone, you know, as a kid who wanted to do the hard, difficult, gritty things? 
Yes, for (laughs) sure. (laughs) I was always that you know, loud, outspoken girl on the playground, running around at a young age with the boys playing soccer and whatever. And to me, I never put myself in this box of I can only do X, Y, or Z because I'm a female or because I'm only getting these type of grades or whatever. I just thought, well, if there's something that I want to do, I'm going to do it and I'm going to work really hard to achieve my goal. And you know, when you have that kind of confidence and that kind of perseverance, it it can tend to rub people the wrong way who possibly are either intimidated by that or maybe don't have that self-confidence that you have. And so you face challenges, but, you know, I feel like if you don't have people in your life that are, I don't want to say against you, but, you know, that people that look at you in a different way than maybe other people do, then you're not doing something right, you know, because you want to inspire people. And some Sometimes inspiring people and empowering people can also, you know, for lack of a better term, excuse my French, but piss a few people off. (laughs) So, yeah, I think this is so true. And I think especially for women, too, I know that I've kind of been exploring my relationship with like niceness and wanting to be perceived a certain way. And it's just so interesting how at least for me, my journey of building confidence has involved like letting go of this more needy side of me that wants this approval. And it it would be so great if like the road to confidence and empowerment was like all rainbows and unicorns and you never had to like do something that felt deeply uncomfortable because you're worried about what people will think. But there is this element of just like letting go of that, being, you know, being okay with some people not liking you, being okay with like the polarity of what it means to actually step into who you are and just fully own that. Absolutely. And for me, I try to tell people, you know, self-criticism and fear is the biggest hurdle for a lot of people pursuing a goal because positive self-talk and not letting society define my worth has become a true staple of my own personal success. And I feel like if you surround yourself with people who inspire you and motivate you and support you, which may mean that they're going to tell you some things sometimes that you might not want to hear, but they're allowing you to own your individuality. And I feel like, you know, God created us for this perfect life purpose and you can't fit yourself into a box of normal because what is even normal, you know, like stop pleasing everyone around you and start doing stuff to please yourself because, you know, people are going to hate on you no matter what. And a buddy of mine in the military um, told me this quote one time and it made perfect sense, but he said, you could be the prettiest, juiciest, most perfect peach, and there will still be people who hate peaches. <laughs> and so that that really just kind of like stuck with me because I was like, wow, like you could be the best at whatever or, you know, Anyways, I just, I feel like that was such a a really well-rounded quote and it really makes you sit back and think like, gosh, you know, that's true. Stop pleasing people. If you're this person in your own mind that you're the best that you can be and you try to be a good human, then that's great and own it. Yeah, I think so. It can be so hard to let go. And I know, you know, you mentioned fear and self-criticism and sort of like self-talk. And that's such a huge topic on this show because it is it is really something that I think gets in the way of people's brilliance shining through because I think that our most brilliant version of ourself is that version where we let everything out, you know, even the parts that we're like, oh, am I being weird? Am I being quirky? Like, are people going to like this? It's the, it's the unfiltered version. It's the raw version. And You know, I think it can feel scary for women to start to show that. And, you know, I'm I'm curious, that makes me curious to ask you sort of how you might have experienced kind of showing your authentic self in this Coast Guard environment, which I imagine was highly male dominated. Yeah, being a strong-willed female, even at a young age, definitely had its challenges. I've always been a believer that regardless of what I'm doing, whether it's sports or being in the military, you know, as long as I'm doing the best I can, what does it matter if I'm a girl? And people who truly know me and know my heart know that that I'm a genuine good person and I just try to do the best and be the best I can. And I feel like that has really translated in my military career. A lot of people would be like, wow, you could you can hang with the guys and do this. I'm like, yeah, because I work just as hard as them. I train just as hard as them. And so nobody, I don't play that girl card, if you will, because I don't, you know, we're all just out here doing the same job. So if I can meet the standard that's required, then, you know, it shouldn't matter, male, female, 
Yeah. And I'm curious, what is your relationship like with your the feminine side of yourself, both just in life and in career? You know, I love owning that. I love being a strong, powerful woman. And I think there's a very fine line of, you know, being like a hardcore, like staunch feminine where, you know, I'm in the street burning my bras, which I don't do. (laughs) But I mean, I think that level of empowerment and that just, you know, owning who you are, I think that's what makes a true feminist, if you will, just someone who like appreciates and loves who they are without any, you know, need to please society. Because like I said, you know, everybody's trying to fit into this box of normal, but let's sit back and ask ourselves, like, what defines normal? And I think if we all just kind of had that perspective and just really owned who we are, because, hey, God doesn't make any mistakes and he made you perfect and just own it. And that's how I try to live day to day. Mm. And were there any women in the Coast Guard that you particularly looked up to? I'm curious why and sort of what traits they had. Absolutely. I mean, there is a handful of very, very strong female leadership in my early days of being in the Coast Guard. And I always took from them a lead by example characteristic. And I appreciated that because these were strong, powerful women in leadership positions that would still be out there and have no problem, you know, sweep in the hangar deck with me or have no problem, you know, doing kind of the, the lesser, the lesser jobs that nobody really wants to do. But they, they led by that example of, Hey, yes, I'm powerful in this position. And yes, I'm strong and intelligent, but I have also no problem going and doing, you know, a low totem pole job because, you want to show the people that are working for you how to work hard for you. Oh, yeah. I love that so much. And I also feel like the willingness to do what needs to get done, that really came through in your book and sort of the humility around that. And I actually think that that, you know, makes you and anyone else who's similar such a strong leader because it's like putting your ego aside and just looking at the mission and asking yourself, like, what is the most helpful thing that you can contribute in the moment? Oh, I absolutely agree. Yeah. I mean, being adaptable in your situation and being able to provide your strengths because everybody has their strengths and their weaknesses. It's, it's finding what your strengths are, capitalizing on that and being able to share that with the people around you in your work environment. And I want to ask you a little bit just like kind of about the monotony and some of the heaviness of what you did. And there was this specific moment in your book where you, you know, and maybe you can share a little bit of context around your Hurricane Harvey search and rescue, but you essentially talked about how you had been on this long, like grueling search and rescue then got, you know, a few hours of sleep. And then, you know, the alarm goes off again for you to start it all over. And you're like waking up after this long rescue and you're putting back on your your flight suit from the day before. And it's like still cold and wet. And like you're going back <laughs> out for a whole nother day. And I don't know when I read that. Well, first of all, your writing just like literally like puts the person right next to you which made it like so enjoyable to read your book. And that was one of those moments where I really felt that like, as I was reading that, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, pu- I'm putting on the wetsuit. Like I, I feel it. I feel like I'm right there with her. <laughs> and I guess what I wondered most is like, like a moment like that where like you're tired and there's so much going on. It's like, what is going through your head in that moment? And how do you not fall down kind of like a spiral of like, oh my gosh, I can't, I I have to do this again. Oh, absolutely. And first, before I answer, I just, I have to say that I had a handful of really, really amazing people that helped, helped me tell my story. You know, I had a couple editors and my friend Katie did a great job with bringing her personal Coast Guard experience into helping me with the stories. But, you know, anytime anybody writes a book, it's always a handful of people that help hone it to, to its perfect spot that it is right now. So I'm very thankful for them. But to answer your question, you know, I, I was just thinking back to um, the hurricane rescues and stuff. And I can just still feel like as I sit here today and talk to you, I can still sense all of the emotions, a great deal of what I was feeling and what I was seeing. And, you know, the only aside from adrenaline, I think that was my main source of life throughout those days is just pure adrenaline. But 
you know, when I went out there, I was very acutely aware of what I was going to encounter. And I think we all were for the most part. But, you know, when you see that devastation and you look into each and every one of these people's eyes when they come up into the cabin after they just escaped certain death, I mean, that really does something to your psyche. And at the end of the day, when you go back and you lay your head on on the pillow or wherever you're laying your head, that's kind of what replayed in my head. And I couldn't really sleep and I couldn't really think about my own wants or desires knowing that there was these people out there that desperately needed our help. So I I mean I just feel like that's what fueled my personal just, you know, push myself to the limit both mentally and physically because that reward, you know, is priceless when when you can sit there and say, wow, somebody is alive today on this earth because of my actions and our, you know, all the crews, you know, from the people in the operations center and the people that are doing the maintenance on the helicopters to the people that are actually flying in the helicopters. I mean, every single person has an integral, integral part. And I feel like that's what keeps us just motivated. I, I feel like I can speak for everybody in the Coast Guard, but that goal, when we sign that dotted line to serve our country, the ultimate goal is to do just that, is to save people and help people. And so when that opportunity arises, you are just on fire for that mission. Did you ever have moments where that fuel kind of led you to perform in a mission and then you looked back and you were almost in awe of what you're able to do? Like maybe you wouldn't have thought you could have done what you did? Absolutely. There was multiple times where I think, wow, how did I physically or mentally com- complete the mission? I mean, because you're flying in these scenarios where you can't see much. So you're constantly on edge mentally. Okay, am I going to run into a power line? Is there going to be low laying trees? Are there other aircraft out here that are on the same mission? So you have that mental fear. And then couple that with the typical physical, you know, feelings that you're having of being worn down and you're cold and you're hungry and you're tired. And then for me, as you read, I was also dealing with um, an underlying autoimmune disease that I wasn't quite sure what was happening to me as well. So there was definitely times, multiple times throughout my flights where I felt that. But again, I just reminded myself that I was out here serving a bigger purpose and that, you know, I had God's peace protecting me and, and I knew that that he would make sure that we all got home. And he did. And I want to go into some themes that really jumped out in your book. They were constant throughout. And it was really a joy to kind of see them emerge through your stories and through the way that you see the world. The first one we've talked a little bit about, but I'll just bring it to the surface in case there's anything you want to add. But it's just dealing with uncertainty and the unknown. And you mentioned your autoimmune condition and sort of all of the scariness that that brought on. Is there anything that you'd want to share around just uncertainty and moving through that like scary gray area of not knowing what's next? For me, I like to just focus on small victories. I think if, you know, sometimes we get really overwhelmed with like the big picture of life, like, oh my gosh, where am I going to be in 10 years or 20 years? But I think just kind of, of course, those things are important to think about. But realistically, like the day to day, the battles that we face that we can overcome, I feel like those are the stepping stones to really achieving those those big lofty goals. You know, I, I think that we can get overwhelmed with the bigger picture. And there was one small time I, I have kind of a funny story about my early Coast Guard days, but there was one moment in my early Coast Guard career and I was a mess cook in San Juan, Puerto Rico, which a mess cook, just to give you a little background, is kind of like one of the worst jobs you can have as a brand new person in the military. You're basically working in a kitchen, cleaning up dishes, uh, wiping down tables after people. It's, It's not very glamorous, but it was my job. And I was young in the military and I was kind of getting fed up with it. And my supervisor, one day came in and was like, this place looks terrible. The dishes aren't clean. And he made all of us go in and really clean every single pot and pan and had us scraping everything. And I bring up that story because in the moment I was steaming mad. I was like, we've been here all weekend, you know, doing these terrible jobs. But I look back and in that 
that really did shape me. And that reminded me that, yes, this is a small job in the grand scheme. It's not very glorious. It's not something that everybody loves to do, but you have to have integrity and integrity is doing the right thing when nobody else is around. So that, that, that really helped me at an early age and an early in my career to realize that no matter what job, how big or how small, I wanted to focus on that small victory, doing it right and doing it good. And that really sets a foundation for the bigger things like flying around in a hurricane and saving people. (laughs) It's true. And I I think sometimes those big things that we want in our lives, they, they can feel unattainable. And I think our brains really forget that even the biggest thing is just made up of a million tiny things. And I think it's also kind of a relief in the sense that a lot of a lot of the women who listen to this show are on this journey of building and finding confidence. And I think one of the most important things on that journey, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts, is to allow the steps to be really small and to not put pressure on oneself to get it right or have it be so perfect the first time around, but to really, it's almost like an act of love to allow yourself the humility and patience to make the tiniest little steps of progress. I couldn't agree more, Jessica. I mean, we're, we're human. We're flawed. We're going to make mistakes. It's bouncing back from them. And, you know, just like you read in my book, I mean, I had a lot of adversity. I went through a lot of things and, and everybody in their life goes through challenges, whether it be family, personal health. And I just think that having the confidence and that, again, I go back to that same word, that peace, knowing that you can bounce back from it, that no one's holding you back from moving forward. And I'm probably going to butcher this quote because I don't quite remember it, but I love it. It's something along the lines of a woman who doesn't require validation from anyone is the most feared individual on the planet because it truly is a level of freedom that can't be taken away. And so I, I kind of just try to live by that day to day. Like I'm, I'm just out here trying to live my best life and there's going to be people that don't like me and I can't please everybody, but I just try to do the best every day for my personal life and the goals that I have. Yeah, it's true. And it's, it's almost sort of when you allow yourself the space to be imperfect and to mess up, it almost goes hand in hand with allowing yourself to not be liked by everyone and making peace with the fact that we are all different and that, you know, it is okay to not have likability be the most important thing and be running your life. And I I do think though that getting there, like getting to the point where you can detach from needing that approval from everyone, like really requires you to get to that place with yourself where you can look at your flaws and you can look at yourself in the mirror and just like be okay and and be at peace in that moment, even though you're not exactly who you want to be or where you want to be quite yet. Absolutely. 1000%. You know, you talk to any of my friends and they'll tell you that I'm just the loudest, most confident one in the room. And sometimes it's like, I don't mean to be like, cause I'm not the most confident person. I have my, you know, self confidence issues, just like any other person on, the, on this planet. But I just learned, listen, yeah, I'm flawed, but I love it. I accept it. I own it. And if you don't like it, that's okay, but I'm still going to love me. <laughs> yeah. I think that that energy is just, you know, first of all, I hope it's contagious. I hope we all catch it from you and from each other. <laughs> um, but that sort of, you know, when you get into that, that's when life, becomes more open, more joyful, more fun. And there's always the struggles and the hard things. But I think when you can really get into that energy too, like you can really be present and get out of your head and just like enjoy what's happening in the moment. Yes, I couldn't agree more. It's it's like I said, it's that level of freedom when you find it. It's and, and that's why I always want to share that because it's like I found this gold mine of like millions of gold bars or something. And I just want to tell everybody, look, look over here, like check out all this gold. <laughs> and that's why I'm just like, I, I constantly talk about the peace that I have, not only through my faith, but through some un- unfortunate circumstances that have happened in my life that I was able to take good from, which I mean, I look back at some things and I'm like, wow, how did I turn this terrible situation in my life and somehow manage to find a blessing or something good from it? And I think if we all did that, and and I don't want to say 
you know, you're allowed to feel bad for yourself at times, but it's very, you have to be very careful about that self-pity because that's just going to steal that peace from you. So yeah, I just try to live every day with a, with a positive attitude and look at the good in everything and everyone. Yeah. And that self-pity, it, it keeps you in the same place. And I think, you know, maybe sometimes you need to like be in it for a bit and you're like, you're not ready to move, but then there comes a point where it's like you, you need to get from like stuckness into movement and you have to like leave that behind in order to make that shift. And what you said just really reminded me of kind of just like your book overall, your story, your writing, the way you talked about taking something difficult you've experienced and essentially finding the value in it. And I think that this is really important. And I think, you know, as a writer, as someone who told your story, I think that the writing process can almost force us to look at something and actually find the lesson in it. Did you experience that as you were writing your book? Yes, absolutely. I actually started writing this as sort of a form of therapy because truthfully, when I came back from the hurricane stuff, I started dealing with a lot of, I guess now looking back at it, like PTSD symptoms. I was having nightmares and just having a really hard time processing some of the traumatic things that I saw. So I I did. I started going to a counselor, which I see nothing wrong in, in doing. And I think that even you know, people that think that they have their life together and all that it w- would still find benefit from going. But anyways, yeah, I started to just go there and my counselor suggested, you know, why don't you just start typing up or writing down some of these memories and some of the stuff and help you process it. I did. And then one day I was meeting up with my friend Katie and and I kind of was telling her about my stories and she just was like, oh my gosh, like you need to write a book. And I, at first I kind of laughed it off and I just was like, ah, I don't know. And then for some reason, I, I just felt like it was pressed upon my heart to share my story, which truthfully was the bravest thing I feel like I've ever done even through the rescues because, um, you know, opening your personal life up to somebody um, for judgment is is terrifying. But the positive positivity and the the wonderful feedback that I've gotten from people like how it's helped them in their life and how they were able to overcome different things by sharing similarities in my story. I mean, again, you just can't put a price on that. And it really validates all the reasons that I wanted to write the story. Yeah. Oh, you're like your whole experience and everything you share is so interesting and fascinating to me. And one thing that I want to highlight for anyone listening who's experiencing some sort of struggle of their own, this process that I'm talking about and asking you about of like sort of writing your story and using that as a vehicle to shift your perspective, I feel like you don't, writing helps you get there. It really does. It's a powerful medium. But I think that mental shift where you look at something and say, like, where's the story in this? You know, if my life were a book or a film, like in what way am I the heroine and in what way can I emerge victorious? And I think that that's a really powerful reframe for someone who's in any sort of difficult situation because it just helps you see that you you get to control the future in some ways and you get to make choices. And sometimes it's easier to make the empowering choices if you can find meaning in the thing that's really difficult for you. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. I definitely think that going back to um, what I was mentioning, uh, getting back from the hurricane rescues and just not feeling 100% mentally, as a strong woman and as a strong person in general, you know, it takes a lot of humility to say, you know what, I need help. I need to talk to somebody. And that has also become a big passion project of mine is just to, to let people know like, hey, it's okay to not be okay. Like, I mean, to to go to somebody, whether it be a therapist or a friend or somebody, just to talk about things, there's nothing wrong in that. And matter of fact, that that makes you even more brave, I feel, to be able to to stand up and say, okay, this might be a little embarrassing and I feel like I'm strong and this is not necessarily a trait of somebody who's strong. Well, I'm here to tell you that that that's not true, that it is the most strongest thing that you could do for yourself and for the people around you in your life to be the best person that you could be potentially is we have to deal with some of the harder times in our life so they don't come back to haunt us. It's so fascinating. You know, it's interesting how being strong is like this solid exterior in a way. And I think that's how we think of strength. But the way that I've always thought about it is it's like this solid exterior and then like beneath it, it's really soft and gooey. And I know, you know, I'm curious how it is for for you. I can share my 
my experience of this, but I am someone who I kind of have kind of like a strong way of being in the world. I can be a little bit intense and I like to, I like to not ask for help. I have that tendency for sure. And I think like accessing the softer layers, which actually makes the strength so much more real. It it can feel scary. It can feel vulnerable. Those first few steps going in and kind of looking at that and kind of being gentle with yourself, it feels scarier than being strong. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Jessica. I mean, like I said, I I had for so long, I mean, everything that you read in my book, you know, I never truly dealt with, you know, those, those personal things I went through, things with my father, things with work. I kind of just was like, oh, okay, let's move on with life. And I think getting back from the hurricane rescues, that kind of, for me, was like the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. It was like, okay, I'm dealing with some emotion things that I haven't faced yet. I need to go back, start from the beginning, and really process some things that I've been through. And you're right, that's that soft inner layer, once you break that outer shell and crack into it, it is, it's terrifying, but it just, it kind of, there's something in that healing process that oh man, you can't even put words on what it does for your psyche, not to mention that you can use your testimony to help others. Did it feel kind of unnatural at first? How did you oh, yes. allow yourself that softness? <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I um, It took me quite a while to really open up to even my like therapist. I would go and he would try to talk to me for so long and I'd be like, yep. Hey, how how you doing? Yep. I'm good. I'm great. Great today. Yep. Things are awesome. And then when he finally started like breaking it down and kind of like, let's talk about this, that, and the other, I just, it came and it came in a flood of just like, okay, let's talk about it all. (laughs) So, but I, I, I didn't realize at the time that that's what I needed and it was the best thing ever and getting that off my chest and talking about it, uh, you know, it, it, it brought it to light, which made it easier for me to look at and work through. And I love it too, because I think when we acknowledge that everything you're speaking about is part of the strengthening process, it also allows us to have a more well-rounded definition of strength, which includes the hardness and also makes room for the softness. And I know, you know, a lot of women, I can speak to my experience and some women who listen to the show are super ambitious, maybe in a work environment where their femininity isn't the norm and they kind of feel like that they feel like strength looks like that hard way only. And they're trying to find that balance between the two. And I think that as women, it's so important for us to have permission to access the softness to use our femininity to kind of allow all parts of ourselves to be part of, you know, that strong version of ourselves that we're trying to become. Yes, definitely. I mean, I think another key factor in conjunction with what you just said is setting up those like healthy boundaries. I, I feel like that's like such a cliche word, but healthy boundaries are are huge in letting people know, hey, yes, I'm strong. I'm I'm there to help you. I'm caring, but here are my boundaries and, you know, I'm not going to allow myself to be disrespected or take advantage of or be looked at as weak or whatever the case may be because I have self-worth. And when you have that self-worth and that understanding of, I know that I'm a great person and I want to help other people and be strong, but I have these personal boundaries that require respect from other people. And so it's, it's kind of, um, a two part for me of, like you said, being very strong, but also showing people that I can be weak and tender and sweet and and be there for you, but that doesn't take away from my strength. It actually adds more strength to my character and, and who I am as a person. Absolutely. It's adding all of the dimensions behind strength. So instead of it being just like this one dimensional thing, it's infinite and it contains so much complexity. And if we try to reduce it down to one thing, it's not strength anymore. It's something else. Oh, for sure. I agree. Definitely. Before we get into the next section, I'm just seeing if there are any other pieces that I want to get your thoughts on. I guess the one that I'll bring in before we pivot is just mistakes. I think in the moment, especially, you know, with the work that you do, I'm sure there are so many quick decisions where 
if you had infinite time to think about something, you probably could figure it out. But, you know, I'm guessing there were there times where you are under very like time is ticking, you're on a, a mission and you have to decide and it's hard to make a perfect decision under those circumstances. All the time. I mean, especially in the the realm of military, more specifically Coast Guard and Coast Guard aviation, there is so many times where we have, we have to make split second decisions and different calls throughout our missions. But I go back to the integrity level of that. I mean, I've made a million mistakes. I mean, I was an avionics electrical technician and worked with million dollar components. And I can't tell you how many times I've accidentally dropped something or accidentally made a mistake or whatever the case may be, but I've always owned it and said, yep, I did this, my bad, like, because if if people are going to respect you and want to work with you, they have to know that they can trust you and that you're own up to your mistakes. So aside from probably ruining millions of dollars of equipment, oops, um, (laughs) as far as being on the missions and actually flying, our team unity in that aircraft, we all make that split second de- decision together and we succeed as a team or we fail as a team. But no matter what, that um, team mentality really carries us through all those decision making processes. Yeah. And one thing that I really noticed that was very joyful to read in your book was as you're in the middle of rescuing someone, like that constant flow of communication. And, you know, to someone, who isn't in the Coast Guard and hasn't had this experience, like it can almost feel like, oh my gosh, like you're over communicating and like you're always updating them (laughs) every few seconds. But there's also, you know, and of course I'm sure it's part of the protocol, but there's like, there's a magic in that too. And that like, you guys are just like this inseparable interdependent unit. And it's almost like you just go into this mode and you're in the flow of this information going back and forth. And it was fascinating to read about that. Awesome. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed reading about it. I was really wanting to make my reader feel as if they were sitting right next to me in that helicopter. I wanted them to feel the emotion and smell the rainwater and, you know, look into these eyes of these people that you're you're being rescued into the cabin. But going back to the constant flow of communication, it is we are just like a well-oiled machine of training. I mean, we spend thousands of dollars and th- well, I say millions of dollars and probably millions of flight hours training just so when we do have to make those missions and go out and save people, we're out there and we're doing it. It doesn't matter what pilot you're with, what rescue swimmer you're with. Everybody has the same level of training. You're all trained on the same requirements. So and, and that reason for that constant flow of communication is, you know, one split second in an, in an aircraft, a lot can change. And so that constant flow of as a flight mechanic, letting my pilots know, hey, your position's good or, you know, easy forward, right 20 or whatever, because, you know, gusts of wind and different variables. I mean, things definitely do change rather quickly. So it's just it's important to keep that line of communication going. So everybody's on the same page and there's no surprises. Did your patients become deeper and more stretched through all of that training and those experiences? 100%. I feel like anybody who talks to me will tell you that I'm like dramatic with my arms and I'm very like all over the place and loud. But in that helicopter, it's like a flip of a switch and I just go and I... I center myself back to that place of peace again, and it is just a smooth flow of communication, and you have to be, you know, bold, concise, and because pretty much everybody's life in that aircraft depends on it, so you kind of have to be able to flip that switch. Yeah, and I guess the last piece on this that I wanted to ask you about is sort of decisiveness and just allowing yourself to make a clear choice in the moment. Is that something that you had to train to like quiet down the voice that was like, oh, like what if you choose the wrong thing? Or have you always been someone who can kind of go into a situation and say, I feel, I trust my instincts. I feel good about doing this. I'm not going to second guess it. Yes, I think I'm the latter. I I think that just about in any situation, people can talk themselves in and out of just about anything. So what I've learned and and in conjunction with my training in aviation is that if you make a decision, be bold in it and hope it's the right thing. And it's kind of like, what is that saying? It's like, 
ask questions later kind of thing where it's just you get into it, you make a decision. And also the beauty about being in a crew where we're all just in it together and talking is that no one person really makes all the decisions. Like if I'm getting ready to deploy my swimmer down to the water and we're trying to figure out how to rescue an individual, you know, it's not just me making all the decisions and it's not just my rescue swimmer or my pilot. We're having a very in-depth conversation. So there's there's definitely um, a piece involved with that too. Like, hey, we're all in this. We're all on the same page and we just go out and and get it done. What does the kind of postmortem process look like after a mission is completed to kind of figure out like, okay, what was working and what were like some of the critical decision points? Is there a process around that? There absolutely is. So typically the military in general, we're a big fan of briefs and checklists. Okay. That's what we do best. (laughs) And so before every flight, before every takeoff, before every hoisting evolution, every time we get back from a flight, every single moment you have a checklist and or a brief to talk about the uh, evolution. So um, when we get back from every single quick case, it is required to have a post-flight debrief. And so we go through and we sit there, okay, did we complete the mission? Did we violate any rules, you know, was the risk versus, or was the gain outweighing the risk? And, and we just have a a very in-depth, real, raw conversation. We take our, you know, our rank and our rate off of the table and we all just talk as, as a little aircraft family, if you will. And we're just real with one another. And we, we learn a lot from those both good and bad outcomes. Each time we just get better and better at like, okay, Hey, last time we did this and it worked out well, let's see if we can do it again. It opens up a line of communication to help facilitate better rescues in the future. And when you mentioned taking everyone's ranking off the table, is that just kind of like a mindset shift of we're just all going to have an open discussion about this, regardless of everybody's ranking? Yes. I'll speak mostly on Coast Guard Aviation. I know the boat worlds may be a little bit different, but in Coast Guard Aviation, I mean, we're all flying in this aircraft that if any of us were to make a mistake, that we're all we're all doomed. <laughs> so with that being said, we can't facilitate an environment in the aircraft where we're, oh, I'm scared to speak up because I'm a brand new person and this is a commander who has, you know, thousands of flight hours. That kind of has to be off the table in order for people to feel comfortable and speak up in the event that they see something that's wrong or potentially dangerous. So Coast Guard Aviation definitely tries to not look at ranking as much as, hey, you're a person, your life is in this aircraft, we're all on the mission. Let's be a team, let's be a family and talk about this together. So fascinating. It's it's really interesting how some of your stories are like this intense real world amplification of what happens in my world where the stakes are many, many notches lower and yet the dynamics parallel. So it's so it's very fascinating for me to hear you talk about these things. And so many women who are listening deeply relate to not having to, you know, not having the courage to speak up in a room where they feel like they're the most junior person in the room. And, you know, I think that there's just something like deeply grounding in hearing you share that perspective from the Coast Guard, where all of, you know, all of these things are at stake and there's no room for that. And it's almost empowering in a way because it's sort of like, oh, well, you know, she's got to do it in this situation there's no reason why I can't learn to do that also. For sure. And I, you know, with that being said, I think that, you know, translating that into every other profession, I mean, I think of how many inventions and how many great role models and leaders at one time were at the bottom of the totem pole and just had the courage to speak up and say, hey, I have an idea or, hey, let's try doing something this way. And think of all the amazing things that come from just having that courage, you know, to speak up and maybe go against the grain of normal thoughts. And if we had more leaders in this world instead of sheep, you know, think of what a world it could turn into be just a positive one with people that will stand up for the right thing and have new ideas being brought to the table. Oh, that, yeah, that resonates with me on such a deep level. One of the driving forces for me behind this show was the idea that if there are women out there who are not speaking up or not bringing their full brilliance out, it, it means the world is going to miss out on what they could have contributed had they allowed all of that to come out. And I think 
often it is women who are incredibly talented and brilliant who also struggle with bringing it out. And so it's sort of like I see it as like this untapped potential or almost like this buried treasure of, you know, like we need to focus on unburying this treasure. Otherwise, it's going to be there and we're never going to know. It's never going to shine and we're never going to get to enjoy it. Oh my gosh, Jessica, that is so true. I just feel like, you know, don't let the world dim your shine. And more importantly, don't let your own personal, you know, lack of self-confidence or your ability, your inability to maybe speak up at times, don't let that dim your shine because you definitely, uh, you know, have a purpose and have a great, you know, everybody has pros and cons. Everybody has something amazing to bring to this table. I think back again to some amazing female mentors that I had, like Tina Pena, Joan Snaith, Mary Martin. Like These were all strong, powerful, well-versed female aviators. And each one of them had a, a strength that I took and I wanted to mirror that. And I think, you know, speaking about women in general and in, in positions at different work environments, by doing the same And taking those different qualities from other strong leaders and incorporating that with your brilliance, I mean, it's it's just a beautiful thing what somebody can unlock with that power of a thought process. I totally agree. And I think in its infancy, when someone is first building the confidence, it requires this little leap of faith, you know, where you're not quite sure yet how you're doing. You haven't really gained momentum building confidence. And it sort of goes back to what you said of like, well, just do one small scary thing because that's going to be the thing that gets the ball rolling. No, definitely. I mean, fear is the biggest inhibitor in life. And, you know, for me as a Christian, you know, I always bring this up, but like it says, do not fear 365 times in the Bible. And so every single day I try to bring that in and just say, what am I afraid of? If I fail, there's going to be a lesson learned, or there's going to be somebody else who will see my mistakes and they'll know not to do it or whatever the case may be. It's just like, what's the worst that can happen? Don't let fear inhibit you know, the amazing potential that you have in your life. And that's kind of how I've been able to accomplish these wonderful things is I haven't let that fear, even if I have been afraid. Now there's a big difference. You can be afraid of things, but just not letting that fear put a roadblock in this potential goal or this potential amazing thing that you could accomplish. Yeah, for sure. And it's almost sometimes like fear is the signpost that you know that there's something good. It's almost like fear is like the sign of where the buried treasure is. So like when you see it, you know that that thing, there's probably something incredible behind it. Oh, for sure. Oh, I love that. Yeah, it's, it's so fun <laughs> to hear your perspectives on this. And Thank you. yeah, it's just like, it's a joy and it's it's really empowering for me to listen to. And so I'm excited to, you know, for other women to experience your wisdom and just get to hear about it. And let's talk about your book, which I have started to gush about a little. It was, first of all, I flew through it and it was... <laughs> I felt like I was there with you, and I think I told you this already, but there's just something about it where you come off as this heroine, and yet I related to you so much. You were so relatable in the way that you wrote about things and explained things, and I loved it. I guess you know you shared a little bit about why you decided to write it. Is there anything else you want to share about the artistry behind telling your story or just the experience of creating it and putting it out in the world? Oh, absolutely. So I'll start by saying that I feel like there's still a lot in my book that I, I kind of just breezed the surface, but I really do appreciate you saying that you loved it so much and that it was an easy read because that's really what the goal was. Is I wanted to, at the end of the day, I wanted every reader to pull some portion of my story and have it help them, inspire them, empower them, whatever the case may be. But there's there's no greater reward in sharing your life story when you know that people are being, you know, empowered by it. I wanted to just reiterate the fact that um you know, you don't have to be some great hero and save people. And, you know, speaking of the word hero, I always felt really uncomfortable when people, you know, spoke about me or about anybody in my crews, like, oh man, you guys are all heroes. It's because, you know, we don't really look at ourselves like that. And one one day my friend Aaron told me, well, you may not think of yourself that way, but that's how other people look at you. And I was like, well, I feel like anybody would go out and just help people if they were in trouble. And she was like, well, no, like that's just it. Unfortunately, there are people that don't have that courage or whatever to go out and want to 
to serve like that. And it kind of was like a, like a jaw dropping moment for me because I just, I didn't realize that that's how people kind of looked at me and I'm just so average. And that's again, why I wanted to share my story is like, Hey, look, you know, yes, I did these amazing rescues with my crews and I had the honor of going to the presidential state of the union in 2018 and get the, get these awards and these accolades, which are all great. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I put my pants on just one leg of a time like everybody else. So I'm pretty average. I'm pretty normal. And I wanted to utilize that little bit of uh, a platform, if you will, you know, with the hurricane stuff and share my personal stuff and just let people know like, hey, I'm normal. What you're going through is normal. And I, I hope that it just really inspires and empowers every single person that reads it. I would love to also see a photo of your dog. <laughs> I think there are one or two in the book, but I just loved how you talked about your dog. <laughs> she's pretty much the MVP. She's like the main character in the story. Let's be serious. <laughs> Every time she popped up, I was like, yay. I don't know. It made me happy and I could feel your love for her and like just the comfort of coming home to an animal after, you know, an intense grueling thing. It's like, what more could you want in that moment? Oh my gosh. Mandy Pants is pretty much the best dog on the planet. I'm just saying. Um, I'm like seriously one of those psycho dog moms. It's pretty bad. But, you know, she's just so good to me. And like you said, I mean, she was the one constant in my ever crazy chaotic world. I mean, I've transferred to a bunch of different military bases and she's been right there with me. She's been right there when I came home from a rough day to, you know, give me love when I'm sitting there crying. And, you know, I, I think in conjunction with, with with her, I've also been so blessed to have this amazing circle of family and friends that have also been just a true a blessing to me. And they've also been there to help, you know, empower me in my times of weakness. And yeah, but I love Mandy. I definitely should have thrown about 15 more pictures in there, but <laughs> there's no such thing as too many pet pictures ever. I agree. I agree. <laughs> and okay. So tell us where we can find your book as I'm sure that there are people who are going to be interested in checking it out. Oh, awesome. Well, yeah, right now I have my book. It's called The Hurricane Within. It is on Amazon. And I have some really cool projects coming up in the future. So I am asking people if they want to know and get the first insider scoop, if they go to my website at www.thehurricanewithin.com and subscribe to the email list, they'll be the first in the know and get some special sneak peek previews of some things. So um, yeah. Oh, wonderful. And I'll put that information below in the show notes. And I also just wanted to give you a chance to speak to any women who have curiosity around the Coast Guard or any of the related branches. I know, you know, that getting women in there is super important. And so if there's anything that you want to share or talk about, uh, I think we would love to hear. Sure. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Jessica, for having me. It's it's truly been an honor to to answer some questions with you and to talk to all the listeners. This, again, is just such a, an amazing byproduct of sharing my story. So thank you for that. And I I think that joining the military has been by far one of the greatest decisions that I've ever made in my life. I think that if anybody out there is looking to join a service, of course, I'm going to you know, recommend the Coast Guard, but any military branch, the, having the ability to serve this great country um, and any facet that that may be is so rewarding. I love Coast Guard Aviation, so that's my plug. But I think talking to a recruiter and just getting information, I think that is the first step in, in possibly making an amazing decision. Fantastic. And Ashley, do you have any other contact info you want to share besides the book website? Absolutely. So I have my Instagram. It's at the hurricane within. I also have like a Twitter, which I'm not super good at using just yet. I'm trying to like hop on that bandwagon and get better. But I also have my Facebook page. It's just the hurricane within and it's a Facebook page. And I try to post a lot of cool videos and stuff from my personal aviation I, experiences. I have a ton of pictures and videos and some sneak peeks of some things uh, that are up and coming. So those, those three avenues are typically what I use the most to communicate with fans and different guests. Awesome. And I'm going to put all of your information below so everyone can check out you and check out your book website. And I don't want to give any spoilers for your book or anything, but do you want to share sort of what brought your 14 years to a close and kind of what, what the future could look like for you? 
So I was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease um, shortly after the Hurricane Harvey rescues. I, I was kind of feeling weird for a little little while, and I do kind of talk about that throughout my book, what I was actually experiencing. But with anybody who's had an autoimmune disease, they're very, very hard to pinpoint because your symptoms can be all over the place, and it's not a very... It's just not something that a lot of people and a lot of doctors know about quite yet. So anyways, I was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, which was ultimately the reason I medically retired from the military because the medication that you take for aviation is grounding, uh, which means that, you know, we're very stringent with what you can take and be able to fly because we want you to be 100% an alert. So unfortunately for me, that was something I could no longer do, but the future looks bright. I mean, I feel, you know, thank God I feel good most days. I, I do take my medication and try to work out and eat healthy and all that. But um, yeah, the future is bright. I'm really pushing forward with some new projects under my publishing company that I have, the Mandy Pants Press, <laughs> um, um, which is so funny. It's my dog's name. See, I told you I'm a psycho dog mom. <laughs> I um, that lady here. <laughs> So yeah, I just, I'm really focusing my time and energy. My new passion project is really talking about mental health awareness and just sharing my story. And and again, hopefully just empowering every reader and moving forward with some other really cool projects that I have in the future. So excited. And I can't wait to see what they are and what you do next. And you've made it to the closing questions. Thank you for such an incredible conversation. And it's funny because one of the closing questions, it's like I created this question out of this random idea that always comes to my mind. And you brought it up, which was really interesting. But the idea is just that we have these huge goals in our lives. And sometimes, you know, the most the most effective ways that we move towards those goals are like these tiny moments where we make a different choice or we do the scary thing. And so I've been asking everyone to share a tiny moment that sort of represented that for them, represented them moving towards their visions and dreams and goals. Man, there's been so many really small but yet very significant events in my life that have helped carve the way for this path that I've been on. For me, one was uh, my faith and, and finding Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That has been the the staple of of my being and who I am. And, and it's definitely changed the actions moving forward in my life, what I want to do. So that's a huge one for me. But again, I just, I bring back to that, that piece that, you know, it's, it's like I said, man, when you find this piece and it's like this pile of gold, you just really want to share that with people. And that's another reason why I did write my book is because I do really want to plant those, those seeds of faith in people and, and let people know that you don't have to live a perfect life. You don't have to, you know, not fail or whatever the case may be, but it'll all come together in the end. And looking back in my personal life, I really am just like, oh my gosh, I see why that happened. Oh my gosh, I see the positive from that bad situation. So yeah, I, I think that's just um, the main foundation for me is is my faith and the peace that I've gained from that and, and wanting to share that with other people. And for the second to last of the closing questions, <laughs> this one's about the name of the show. I try to keep like I try to keep this part of the interview flowing. Otherwise, I'll talk to you for a million hours. <laughs> um, but I just I like to ask every guest to share what the art of speaking up means personally to them. First of all, I love the name of your podcast. I think it's great. I think there's just something so powerful about that. And I kind of personally interpret it in two parts. First, the thing that comes to my mind is being a person that chooses the right thing, even when it seems like a harder option, because I feel like the art of speaking up kind of encompasses potentially speaking up when it's not the easiest option for you. But if it's the right thing to do, I feel like speaking up and and owning your perspective and your opinion as as huge in just your overall being. I think, and secondly, the term speaking up is just standing up for what you believe in and being a leader. And But being somebody that is a lead by example person. Nobody likes that like dictatorship kind of (laughs) leader. You know, people want to relate to you and they want to see, you know, the human side of somebody and not this like outer shell of perfection, because like I said, what's normal? Nobody's perfect. So I, I think being a trailblazer for your own life and what you stand for will inspire more people than you could ever imagine. 
And for the final question, this is always my favorite part of the interview, but some context is that one of the things that inspired me to start this show was I had this period in my career where I was really struggling. My confidence was really low. Everything just felt so overwhelming. And at times it it felt very dark also. And I like to give this moment to the guest to share something to any woman listening who's either maybe in that situation or maybe she's doing okay, but she's just looking to really push herself to the next level. And this is really about what's most important for you to share to uplift someone and and help that person see their full potential. Well, I, I think I think perspective is so key. You know, it's okay to feel down and out and have those depressed feelings and all that. But to come full circle, I think that life is going to have ups and downs and you can sit there and be that person who is a glass half full, or you can be that glass half empty kind of person. And how you perceive things is going to change your outlook and your next steps in your own life. So just try to be positive and see what little bit of good that could be in a bad situation and just never give up. And always know that you can reach out to people if you need somebody to talk to, or if you're feeling down and out like that is okay that's cool I welcome it you can reach out to me and email me anytime you want and we'll talk (laughs) like just never feel alone and know that there's purpose in the dark days and in the, the great days thank you so so much Ashley and thank you for your service oh it's my honor thank you for having me and I hope all the listeners enjoy hearing our conversation today Thank you for tuning in. I hope you're feeling the same way that I was feeling at the end of this conversation, which is strong and inspired and in awe. And I don't know about you, but there is like this part of me, like deep down inside, that hungers and craves to see strong women doing incredible things. And every time I encounter a woman like Ashley, I feel like that part of me just gets nurtured. And I don't know if it's a part of my personality, my spirit, or maybe the universal female spirit, but I found that Ashley and her story and her energy and her wisdom really fed and nourished that part of me. And I hope it did the same for you too. I'm going to link all of Ashley's information in the show notes in case you want to get her book, which I enjoyed so much. I highly recommend it, especially if you're feeling inspired by her. Her book was so inspirational and it was it was one of those reads where like my whole book body and mind was in a different place while I was reading it. It, You know when you're reading something and you're really engaged and it's like you went into a wormhole (laughs) to like some other place and then you came back? That's what reading her book was like for me. So if you're feeling curious, I definitely recommend reading her story. And I'll also link her website and her contact information in case you want to check her out or get in touch with her. Special thanks for Ashley, not just for coming on the show, but for her service and for her time and courage in keeping all of us safe. I'm so in awe of what she does. And that brings me pretty much to the end of this episode. I hope that you're doing well. I would love to hear from you if you want to say hello. I always put my contact information in the show notes. And there's also a section at the bottom of the show notes called free resources, where you can find the private Facebook group for the podcast. If you want to connect with other women who listen to the show, who have things in common with you, there's also a link there to my free ebook, which is all about assertiveness and finding your voice. You can find all of that at the very bottom of the show notes. I would love to welcome you into the Facebook group. I would love for you to check out the ebook. It has some great exercises in it to help you find find a strong assertive voice at work and with that that brings us to the end of today's episode as always there's more coming next week and I hope between now and next week you have an empowered week and I hope that you can maybe channel some of your own inner strength and inner superhero and maybe channel that same energy that same process that Ashley talked about when it comes time for her to just show up and do these wildly courageous things. Thanks again to Ashley. It was such a joy to talk to you and thank you to you for listening and I'll catch you next week. Bye.